Good morning. It's 8.30 on Monday, February 20th. I'm Desiree Frazier, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, a new study from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reveals more adolescents are exhibiting indicators of poor mental health, especially teenage girls. Then, Mardi Gras is back for the first time in two years, but New Orleans businesses are still dealing with a post-recovery economy. Plus, a coalition is calling on Mississippi lawmakers to pass a Crown Act. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. More teens and adolescents are exhibiting behaviors that point to struggling emotional health and stability. According to a new study from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, nearly all indicators of poor mental health, suicidal thoughts, and behaviors increased between 2011 to 2021. The outcomes were worse for teenage girls. Dr. Jahan Sabkan is a physician psychiatrist at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. In part one of our conversation, we discuss the totality of the study and examine what's causing a rise in youth mental health challenges. I'll be honest, I'm not entirely surprised. This is something that, you know, I was anticipating as we have gone through the changes in the world in regards to the pandemic and our current atmosphere being where we are all engaged in electronic services more or virtual world, if you will. And uh, adolescents, um, particularly female adolescents, are more vulnerable because they're feeling more isolated, even though there's this connectedness, but the isolation part is still pretty real. Because instead of it being real connections now, there's these superficial or virtual connections. And so that's not enough to help young women, young girls feel engaged? No. And, you know, essentially the social media devices or platforms do not have good regulation. And so there's a lot of uncertainty and uh, potentially inappropriate, you know, behaviors and conversations that individuals may engage in that leads to further stress, you know, a worse outcome. Also, they found that teen girls reported the highest ever levels of sexual violence, sadness, and hopelessness, sexual violence. How is that coming into play here? Yeah, based on my own clinical observation and uh, my experience in dealing with the the population that I deal with, which is the state of the entire state of Mississippi, my suspicions are that, you know, again, there's just uh, the media, the social media, and our current environment is just so open about talking about various topics, and there's a lot of information available. And here's my hypothesis. The adolescents, and particularly female adolescents, in my uh, experience, come in two forms, um, where they experience anxiety in two forms. If they know too much or if they don't know enough. And so some individuals may know too much by being connected in these virtual worlds and, uh, you know, reading about others and kind of seeing what's happening in the environment. And then they internalize those you know, concepts that they read or hear or experience. And then others may be isolated in terms of, you know, they're not really truly connected with their families or their loved ones. And so they're not getting the appropriate guidance or counseling. Um, so I'm not, I'm not entirely surprised that that's also on the rise, the, especially the sexual violence aspect, because, uh, One of the things that has happened based on the virtual reality is, you know, there's no filter, unfortunately, and people can say all sorts of things, and that's how it, 
um, postulating that that's probably how it starts. I came across uh, an editorial or an opinion piece in the Washington Post, and it says American teens are unwell because American society is unwell. Does that speak to you in terms of what you're seeing? Yes, I would agree so. Because, you know, the mental health issues are not just based on a single cause. There's usually multifaceted aspects, and the you know concept of nature versus nurture. That's definitely we're now talking about more the you know uh, nurture part. If the society is behaving in such a way or thinking in such a way, where are adolescents who have not fully matured? Even speaking from a biological standpoint, their brain is not fully matured yet, and they're Frontal lobes, particularly, are vulnerable to making impulsive, you know, inappropriate, risky decisions. And if they don't have good role models or good examples of what, you know, what basically should be a safe, healthy environment, then they're not going to understand that aspect either. Does that mean that we have a lot of adults who aren't role modeling adult behavior, responsible behavior, respectful behavior? Yeah, and that's a great question. You know, in in my profession, I obviously am dealing with a subset of population. So what I see, absolutely, but I want to caution, I don't exactly know what a lot means, but based on my interactions with the patients that I am seeing or their families, yes, I see that quite a bit. And uh, parenting, it's not necessarily intentional or malicious. It's just, you know, parenting is, is difficult. And, and the unfortunate uh, and, I guess, fortunate, you can, whichever way you look at it, is that no two children are the same. So, Even if you've raised a child previously, raising a second child doesn't make it easy. There's a lot of like, you know, learning on the parent's side as well. I I often see parents who are not fully well versed in how to use social media or how, you know, what their kids are into these days or how to connect with them because the generational gap and the technological advancement is just so significant. Does that mean that parents need to take that extra step to get more engaged in those areas? Absolutely. That's that's the trend that I'm I'm seeing. I'm also, you know, myself a young parent, and I have a lot of friends who are also young parents. And um, again, this is, you know, not based on any scientific, but just more observation and my interactions with the healthy families, the healthy individuals that I come across. I see the main difference. You know, I can't come to often ponder is how much quality time the guardians, the parents, the caregivers are spending with their with their uh, children or or with their adolescents. Dr. Jahan Seb Khan is a physician psychiatrist at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. In part two of our conversation, there's a huge disproportion between you know equality and equity and inclusivity. I think as a society, we have definitely come a long way, but there's still definitely more work to be done. The mental effects of bullying and exclusiveness on marginalized communities. That's tomorrow. Coming up, Mardi Gras is back for the first time in two years, but New Orleans businesses are still dealing with a post-recovery economy. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, host of Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking. Join the conversation every Tuesday at 11 as we dissect issues that are important to you and your family. That's Relatively Speaking, Tuesdays only on MPB Think Radio.
This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Mardi Gras is back. After a stay-at-home year in 2021 and 2022 shortened parades, crews will be rolling on their full traditional routes this year. But local businesses are dealing with the weird, volatile, post-pandemic economy. Reporter Carly Berlin has the story. An industrial-sized standing mixer churns a batch of sweet-smelling dough at Loretta's authentic praline. It's one step in the process of crafting the season's beloved king cakes. Oh, Jerry, how many uh, cakes can you get out of one batch? Robert Harrison runs the day-to-day at this family business. One batch gives them 50 king cakes. They're selling more than three times as many a day. And the pace just keeps picking up the closer Fat Tuesday gets. One key ingredient that makes up a third of the recipe? Eggs. Well, guess what? Eggs have went up. Last time Harrison looked at an invoice from his supplier, his eyes popped. His egg order cost two and a half times what it did back in 2018. The impacts of avian flu and chickens, along with inflation, have caused the price of a dozen to skyrocket. But just as high as the prices is the demand for the king cakes. There is no substitute for eggs. I mean, it is one of the most critical ingredients in a king cake. For bakers everywhere. But we've still gotten that, okay, well, we have two and a half times the amount of customers buying King Kings. Almost three times. Harrison thinks it's partly because this year's the first full-blown Mardi Gras since before the pandemic. And because of that, he hasn't had to raise prices. It also helps that not all the King Cake staples went up. They haven't went up on the babies that go into King Cake. So that's a great thing. Getting those king cake babies to New Orleans, along with the beads and light-up throws and all the other random trinkets you end up with by the end of Mardi Gras, that's the job of Mark Flood. He shows me some shiny necklaces with beads the size of baseballs that are flying off the shelf. These are like an ornament. They're called blue molds because they're hollow, but these are very popular. Flood is the owner of TJ's Carnival and Mardi Gras Supplies one of many local shops in the business of selling Mardi Gras stuff. And how does all this stuff get here? Slow boat from China. Yeah. That's, that's about it. Everything comes from China. And getting all this here and time for Carnival hasn't gone so smoothly this year. COVID is still slowing down shipments out of China, including floods. They've been coming in months behind schedule, and that's left him scrambling rushing to get it unloaded and then get it on the floor and sell it. Selling product before it was here. That's not good. Not fun. Mm -hmm. Playing catch up. Still doing it right now. He'll be scrambling up until Fat Tuesday, which he says will be his first day off this year. In New Orleans, I'm Carly Berlin. WWNO is a partner station of the Gulf States Newsroom, a collaboration between Mississippi Public Broadcasting and public media stations in Louisiana and Alabama. Coming up, a coalition is calling on Mississippi lawmakers to pass a Crown Act. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Discover everything MPB Think and MPB Music Radio have to offer with just the sound of your own voice. Ask for the one you want by name. For news, great storytelling, humor, games, and more, say smart speaker, play MPB Think Radio. For musical selections, ranging from a dozen genres from classical to bluegrass, jazz to adult alternative, say smart speaker, play MPB Music Radio. Tuning in is easier than ever. Just ask for the one you want by name. Say smart speaker, play MPB Think Radio. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. 
A coalition in Mississippi wants more protections against hair discrimination, especially natural black hair. We're talking about hair that is locked, braid, uh, bantu knots. Uh, that's what we're talking afros. Cassandra Welchlin is with the Mississippi Black Women's Roundtable. It's one of the advocacy groups that hosted a forum in Jackson to discuss what a Crown Act could mean for Mississippi. She tells our Kobe Vance the natural ways textured hair grows are often deemed unprofessional. We know that um, black people have been discriminated against in the workplace, even and also with children in schools. And so what we want to be able to do is get a law passed in the state of Mississippi, and not just a state law, but also policies changed in schools that will prevent um, and make it illegal for people to discriminate against black hair. What makes black hair so unique? Um, can you talk about textured hair and how it differs from you know, hair from other cultures? You know, black hair is it's kinky, it's curly, um, it's wavy, um, it's so diverse. And so what we are, uh, and we are diverse people, right? And so our hair is just different and it's so beautiful but it's not it's not supposed to be unusual it's just how it grows and so you know this issue has been going on for decades and generations it is how our hair naturally is and people are embracing that and pushing back against it it's nothing wrong uh, with our hair it's just hair it's not just you know it's not straight it's curly it's it's all those different things and so we are bringing awareness tonight at this launch of the crown and glory expo bringing awareness and starting community conversations so that uh, we can begin to organize young people in their schools organize you know women and men on the workforce so that we can get a law that will um, keep businesses and other organizations from discriminating against against our hair. How could this change life for black women, especially in Mississippi? Oh, it could change it tremendously. We know that 80% of African American women are um, are discriminated against um, in the work for, in the workforce, and so this could be huge. Um, that we don't we can live out how we're supposed to be. Um, we can live out uh, without having fear. We can live out in our natural space, in our natural being, um, just just live without uh, fear of intimidation, right? Fear of retaliation, fear of not showing up in our full selves on our workplaces or even in our schools. And also that we remove, you know, stigmas as well. And so just having something like this would just be supported. We shouldn't even have to have the conversation in 2023, but we still are having these conversations, and we're still having experiences where our children are um, not able to play certain sports or can't get in, in a school because of our hair, and that is discrimination, and we're saying enough is enough of that, and we're, we have to put something in place to make people um, know that our hair is well, put something in place to stop that because we already know our hair is beautiful and that we are beautiful, but we have to take it another step further. What do you think has been holding back lawmakers from passing something like this? You know, it took a long time to even take down the Confederate flag. And, um, and so it has to do with who's in leadership, who's really controlling um, the House of Representatives, the Senate. It's mostly white men. And and we see that not just from this um, issue, but when we talk about equal pay for equal work, right? When we talk about extending Medicaid, people in the legislature don't look like um, the majority of the community with these laws, uh, who these laws impact, right? Uh, who these issues impact. And so that's why this year is important when it comes to elections. We need people to register to vote and to get out and vote because we need to elect more um, women in the legislature, more black women. We need to elect more black people in the legislature that looks like us because they have our values. Um, black hair is, um, 
has so is so um, historical in the sense of our families, right? And so many stories that come from you know sitting around the kitchen table and um, and having our moms in our hair, um, having you know men. Um, fathers cutting their son's hair and having conversations and so hair is um, important and black hair is important and it's beautiful and I want black people to embrace their natural style and let's get to work and turn out the vote in 2023. Cassandra Welchlin of the Mississippi Black Women's Roundtable. Efforts to pass a Crown Act have thus far failed in the state legislature. It's a challenge Representative Orlando Payton knows all too well. The Democrat from Clarksdale has introduced a bill three times, but it's never made it to the chamber floor. The leadership um, doesn't understand, nor do they want to take the bill up. Um, The particular is that um, this bill will transform the lives of African Americans, African descent uh, individuals. How do you think this legislation could change Mississippi, especially for black women in the state? Well, I believe one in particular is that it will show that the Mississippi is inclusive of everyone and it can celebrate everyone and it respects all people, no matter what their hairstyle is and and uh, the nature of their hair. And um, we want, I want to move Mississippi forward. What are your conversations with other lawmakers about getting this bill on the table at some point? Well, I spoke to the chairman. Um, He said that he was not going to bring the bill up. It was something that he did not want to deal with this year. And that was the same answer I got the year before and the year before that. What do you think it could do? What, what do you think it's going to take to change that? Well, other avenues that I have been taking is number one, I'm educating individuals about the bill, trying to get advocacy and training for individuals across the state, and make sure that we can cross over party lines so that we can just educate people about this because Mississippi de- deserves better. This bill can bring about a change. We changed the state flag finally. And this is a part of that. I want Mississippi to reach its fullest potential economically, uh, spiritually, just in all type of ways. I want all of us to be one. And we want to truly live up to that definition of us being one and respecting all people, race, creed, color, hairstyle, or whatever. Representative Orlando Payton is a Democrat from Clarksdale. Louisiana is one of the most recent states to pass a Crown Act. There are no federal protections for hair. This has